Oh, let's clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise today. Oh, let's just love him. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he wonderful? Has he been good to you? We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. It is such an honor and a privilege to be with you here in Rialto and to feel the presence of God. I heard those little ones singing and I heard different tonalities and I heard different pitches and I heard revival. That's what revival sounds like. What a beautiful thing. What a sweet presence of God. Amen. I give honor to Bishop Booker and Pastor Booker and their families and this great congregation. You are a blessed people. You are a blessed people. The Bookers have impacted this world. I don't need to tell you how great they are. They, you know better than anybody how great they are. Amen. But I am honored to call them friends and love and appreciate them so much and the stands that they have taken for the things of God and their love for the Word of God. I love men that can go to the Word of God and can extract the honey from the honeycomb. Amen. And bring it to the people that their eyes may be lightened. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And I hope I can just jump in with what you're doing. Revival minded people have a way of just jumping in together and just having church. So, so let's do that this morning. Let's open up the Bible to the book of revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, and <clears throat> what I'm going to be speaking about, I believe, this Sunday is something very dear to my heart, um, and tonight, I'm anticipating tonight, but I, I want to preface tonight with a little something here this morning, because I believe God's doing something so special. I believe God's doing stuff we don't even have a clue how he's going to do it exactly how it's going to turn out but we get snippets we get we get moments where he just flashes it across our field and we catch it out of our periphery out of the corner of our eyes we see things and we wonder and like mary we ponder these things in our hearts amen revelation 21 this is what john said he said and i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more See, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall no more be death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. What a beautiful picture of what is awaiting us. He tells us that he's Alpha and that he's Omega and there's angels with vials and and plagues and voices. I want you to come down to verse 10. The angel carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem Descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, it had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 14, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles. And of the Lamb. If you read, he'll talk to you about measuring the city. 
it lies four square, 12,000 furlongs. The walls, 144 cubits. Walls and foundations, gates made of 12 pearls. What a picture. I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. If you continue to read this, and for sake of time, I won't, you would read about a pure river. And it proceeds out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And you would read about a tree of life that had 12 manner of fruit. And so, with all of this information and all of this vivid metaphoric imagery as a man, a prophet, has these images hitting his mind and his synapses are firing and nerve endings are firing and he's trying to process it and with a with a, an ancient understanding, limited, we try to decipher what it was he was looking at. And so today, by the help of God, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about the mystery of the twelves. The mystery of the twelves. Amen. Look at the person next to you. Tell them God is up to something. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. I think we're getting ready to jump into this thing. <clears throat> and I hope, I hope that I can help somebody today. I hope I can share some things I feel like God has shown me. And I want to take a moment and preface what I'm going to say, that I approach this very, very cautiously. Because... Um, because the word of God is so profound and it is so relevant and there have been so many that have tried to peer into its depths and they have walked away and didn't know what they were looking at and I'm not claiming to know everything I'm looking at but there are some things that are just so beautiful they're so wonderful that I want to look into that mystery and I want to bring back what I saw and share it with people and say to them, our God is so great. His word is so true. Praise God. Um, there's two things you have to be very, very careful about when you are, um, when you're dealing with Revelation, when you're dealing with Daniel, when you're dealing with any eschatological teaching. And I don't claim to be a, an authority on that. But the two things are two spectrum, two ends of the spectrum of one thing. And it's balance. Because you can become hyper literal when you read the word of God. And if you become hyper literal where everything has to have a physical dynamic, then, then you will think that King David is going to come up out of the grave and is going to be walking the earth in a robe judging the nations. Now we know in scripture that, that when the scripture talks about God's servant, David, it's Jesus Christ and the scripture bears this out. So, so there's hyper literalism and then there's hyper spiritualism, which, uh, is, is crazy and it is completely uh, subjective and guys get weird stuff. And I, I had one guy tell me that J-E-S-U-S -S was, was, was given to us in our anatomy by the five holes on our face. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> and, if, and if you believe that, you know, praise God. And maybe, maybe that is J-E-S-U-S. -S. I don't know. But I, I just want to be careful with <laughs> just coming up with stuff because because the word of god speaks for itself it doesn't need our help it just needs the spiritual mind to grab a hold of it and to rejoice in it and to share it and 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 there's going to be common themes and one of those common themes is it's always going to promote the everlasting gospel of jesus christ amen there's no other gospel there's no other salvation there's no other there's no other way into the kingdom of God except that a man would be born of water and spirit. Amen. 
Amen. And, and the things of the Spirit are very, very profound, and it requires the Spirit. It requires the Spirit to, to look into them. So with that preface, I want to jump in here because there's something about the number 12. It's there. It really is there. It's not an imagination. There are certain numbers that resonate. And you have to be careful when you're dealing with numbers uh, because there's, a, there's actually a whole school of thought. It's called gematria, where, where it's a Hebrew school of thought where numbers are everything. And there's these hidden meanings and there's these esoteric meanings, vague and abstract meanings in the Word of God, hidden stuff. And, and I believe it to a very small degree, but I, when you get into three times four and... Divide it by six and then compound. Come on. Um, we're not. that The Bible didn't do that. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to see the patterns. God told Moses, make it according to the pattern that I showed thee in the mount. And there are biblical themes that God called hidden wisdom that were established before the foundation of the world and the kind of wisdom that that jesus looked at nicodemus and said are you a master in israel and you don't know these things amen there is a spirit world and there's a wisdom that goes beyond the empirical observation based wisdom that science and western society gives to us and if you're looking at this from a western mind you are going to miss the beauty and the poetry and the profundity of the word of God. It wasn't written uh, by, by Western educated men that were built upon the scientific method and that had the benefit of the Renaissance and, and the Reformation and all of the, the progresses that we have come to enjoy that have given us the airplane and that have given us beautiful architecture and have given us marvelous technological prowess. All of those things are great. And they're great for building metal detectors. And they're great for building pacemakers. And they're great for building internal combustion engines. But they're not so great at fixing the heart of a man. Or the heart of a woman. Amen. And my God is able to do that. Amen. This is not powered by gasoline. This is powered by the Holy Ghost. It's powered by a supernatural outpouring of God's spirit. And it will save the drug addict from their chemical dependency. It will save the dysfunctional man and woman from their fallen condition. It will straighten out the crooked. Set the captive free. Exalt every valley and bring down every mountain. And it will make a highway for the Lord. Praise God. So the arrogance of Western education tries to look into the mysteries of the word of God and it cannot. It cannot. The kingdom does not come by observation. And it is significant that it was the age 12 that Jesus showed up. Not 11, not 13. I mean, the Bible takes pains to tell us. Why? Why that age? Because there is something about the number 12. Not only is it, does it resonate, but, but the fact that it was a child is a big deal. It's one of the reasons why Friedrich Nietzsche uh, did not like Christianity, because he couldn't fathom how that the business of the cosmos would be entrusted into the hands of fishermen. That it would be given into the hands of tax collectors and shepherds and, and simple common people. And, and the, the power of man and the intellect of man, the Bible says God, God would count it foolish and that it would please him to put it to naught. And he would choose vain, uh, base things and vile things and things that were lightly esteemed and, and a little child The weakest among us will lead us. And so here is this child who is representative of spiritual wisdom and power. There's no way he could know it except by the power of Almighty God. Amen. And God in flesh comes as a 12. 
year-old boy. And he astounds the leaders. He speaks life to them. He speaks like a rabbi, and he hasn't even hit puberty yet. So this is 12. This is our introduction to the number 12. 12 is a big deal. 12 is a big deal. Uh, God, for whatever reason, is in, he insists on it. When, when he takes Levi as a tithe unto himself, as a substitute for the firstborn male out of all of Israel, he takes Levi. That leaves 11 tribes, so he splits, he splits Joseph into Ephraim and Manasseh because God wants that number 12. And when Judas, uh, when he commits suicide and he hangs himself, he falls, he, his bowels gush out, he falls headlong, his bowels burst. And when this happens, they don't leave it 11. They don't say, well, you know, we don't want another one like that. So we got us 11 guys. Let's just kind of batten down the hatches and bolt the inside and let's just lock this thing down. And we know each other and I know you and you know me. They didn't do it, but... There was some divine prompting that said, no, you got to make it 12. So they prayed and they cast lots and Matthias is chosen because God, for whatever reason, wants this number. I, I'm careful not to fall into numerology. I'm careful. And the furthest I'll go into that idea is that it seems to indicate government. It seems to in, indicate that there is a government and 12 seems to indicate that he and I say that because, because the 12 patriarchs are 12. And the 12 apostles are 12. And so there you have it. There's this two groups of 12. Two of them. And they figure so prominently. We would not be here without them. Amen. This, this message that we're enjoying today is a Jewish message. That sprang from the root of Abraham. And its roots are there, but thank God he opened it up to the rest of us. Amen. And so, so while we could not be here without them, they could not be complete without us. Hallelujah. And so we now have an administration where the Holy Ghost can, can be poured out upon men and women that, that have no Jewish blood, but they can partake of the root and fatness of Abraham. Grafted in to the olive tree, a wild olive tree, wild branches. We got any wild branches in here today? Used to bar hop and used to smoke and drink and cuss and run around. And we got some wild branches. Amen. Some people that didn't used to be sophisticated, didn't used to be cultivated, didn't used to be clean cut and clean dress and clean living. Wild branches out in the desert, out in the scrub, surrounded by the reptilian and the, and the desert living. But oh, thank God for the day that he, he plucked you off of there and he brought you in and he grafted you in. He plugged you in to this Jewish message and the sap of Abraham started flowing through your Gentile body and your Gentile spirit. Amen. And fruit started coming out on those Gentile branches and fruit that the original couldn't produce. Love and joy and peace and long suffering and meekness and temperance, the fruit that the caretaker was always looking for, all of a sudden in the Gentiles, it sprouts out on the branches. So, there's a tandem that works together. There's a tandem. There's a 12 and there's a 12. And we see it. We see it over and over and I'm, I'm trying to feel my way through here because I want to make sure I give enough time. Can I take my time this morning? Is this all right? Amen. There are dynamics that go with, and, and it is, it's a 12 of 12. It's actually two sets of 12. I, I think this is who the four and 20 elders are. I, I think it's 12 patriarchs and 12 apostles. Here's what I believe. I, I, I believe that, that there were 12 men that that were raised up from Israel. And Israel's a powerful idea. Israel is a powerful thing. And Israel, interestingly, is not a static thing. 
Israel is not a motionless, static, set in stone dynamic. Israel is a fluid, flexible, living dynamic. Because there was a time when there was one man named Israel. Israel was one man. And that one man wrestled with an angel. Then he wrestled with God. And, and, and refusing to let go and, and pursuing the blessing and, and confronting his carnal nature. Amen. God changes his name. Thou shalt no more be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel. As a prince, you have prevailed. You found power with God. Amen. And so he becomes Israel. And Israel is a man that found and got a hold of something divine and something extraordinary and powerful and supernatural. And he comes down from that encounter limping and halting, the Bible says, but he comes worshiping. Amen. God will touch your life and you may limp afterwards. But as long as you're worshiping, that's what really matters. Amen. You might not ever be the same after that encounter, but as long as you make it into the kingdom, that is what matters. And that's what comprises Israel's identity. Amen. And so Israel then becomes 12 men. So the the, the idea of Israel goes from one man to 12 men. And then those 12 men reproduce and produce 12 tribes and those 12 tribes produce a nation we call them the children of israel and so there is this growth from one to many and and there is a deliverer who comes down off of a mountain and gives them laws and leads them and guides them and and takes them from sinai from egypt into a promised land they become the children of israel and that is the first 12 now Interestingly, this is repeated in the second 12. And God actually refers to Jesus as Israel. In the prophets, the Bible says of Israel, he says, Out of Egypt have I called my son. I called him out of Egypt. And he's referring to Moses and he's calling them out. And he's referring to the Exodus. I called them out and I brought them out to bring them into a a place that flows with milk and honey. And so out of Egypt have I called my son. But when we get to the New Testament, we read that same portion of scripture and it's quoted uh, by the writers in the gospel. And, and, And it says that Jesus coming back from Egypt, having been taken by Mary and Joseph, to escape the wrath of Herod when he comes back into Nazareth. It says that he came from Egypt that it might be fulfilled out of Egypt. Have I called my son? And so there's a first Israel and oh, but there's now there's another Israel. This is Jesus. And there's one man, one man. And that one man embodies the power of heaven. Amen. He is, has full dominion over, over this world. And he's bringing heaven down here to earth. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad for the day he touched your life and for the day that he, that he gave you his favor and let you into this great gospel? And that man brought 12 men. He becomes 12. And from those 12, he then multiplies out. Until there's a multitude. We call that the church. And it springs from the second 12. Amen. But it's the same idea. It's not a static, motionless uh, experience. But it is a moving, fluid, dynamic, praise God, where a man embodies heaven's principles. And he takes it and he gives it to everybody else. And there's a second set of 12 that come on the picture that are going to change the world. Instead of being born of the flesh like you were in the first Israel, now you're going to be born of the spirit in the second Israel. And he is going to give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the wiles of the enemy. Praise God. And now, not only that, but the second, the second one is going to undo what the first one couldn't do. The first one comes into the wilderness and they fall. They fall. They come out from Egypt. And in coming out, they go into the wilderness. Hallelujah. And and they fall in the wilderness. 
And they fall very specifically. They fall with a golden image of calves. They worship golden calves. And, and then they, they, they fail God with regard to bread and with meat. And appetite dominates them. And they, they, they fail God there. And then they tempt God at the waters of Merah. And they tempt God. And the Bible says that they fell. And there's these trials that over and over and over, they, they tempt God, they, they fail, they, they fail in appetite, and they fail in worshiping a golden calf. And, and Moses does the best he can, but the flesh can only take us so far. And an imperfect physical covenant was going to be replaced by a new and a better covenant. Moses is throwing down of the tablets and breaking them. The moment that he comes off of the mountain, God says, I'm going to have to make you a second set. And it prefigures the day that God said, I'm going to have to make a second covenant that is powerful and that is strong. Because you're going to break the first one right out of the gate. But I'm going to make a second set. And it's not just going to be written on stone, but it's going to be written in the tables of your heart. And you're not going to hang them on the wall and forget them. But I'm going to write them on the inside. And you're going to take them with you when you drive in your car. And you're going to take them with you when you go on your job. And you're going to take them with you when you go into your school and you're going to take them when you're with your unsafe family and it's going to be a part of you and I'll write my law on your inward parts and it will require a second covenant and so Jesus comes to undo the failures of the first he didn't just undo Adam's failures he undid Israel's failures <laughs> It is significant that Israel comes through the water and they go into the wilderness. And it is no accident that Jesus goes into the Jordan River and immediately following that, he is driven into the wilderness. It is no accident that the 40 years they wandered correspond to the 40 days that he was out there. And this new man with new dominion overcomes the devils that the first one couldn't <laughs> help us Jesus help me God help my tongue I'm so aware of how my tongue is unable to express these concepts and the mind receives and the spirit receives and it's so beautiful but your tongue gets in the way and your vocabulary is not adequate but I'm just here to tell you Jesus is wonderful Jesus has done things that you can't even imagine. He's not a cliche. He's not just another name that we spout about. But he undid the failures of Moses. He undid the failures of Israel. He undid the failures of Adam. And he is preeminent. And he takes preeminence. And he is worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. He is the only one who is worthy. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And so, <laughs> he, Satan comes to him in the wilderness and says, turn these stones to bread. It's the same thing that he did with Israel. Israel falls. Israel, the Bible says that while the meat was in their mouth, the Lord smote them for their appetite. And Jesus, the second Israel, comes and says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it's not an accident he quotes from Deuteronomy in every single case. Because he's going back and grabbing those Deuteronomic answers and saying, this is how it should have been done. I'm picking up from where they left off. Amen. I'm building a covenant that's not just going to save on the outward, but it's going to save on the inward as well. And I'm going to answer the way it should have been answered. It's like my dad used to say, if you, if you want a job done, you got to do it yourself. I tried to send men. I tried to send prophets. But I'm just going to have to go myself. And I'm going to show them how it has to be done and how they should have said it. And how they, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. This wasn't the second person in the Trinity, but this was the heavenly father rolling up his sleeves and saying, Moses, let me show you how this works. Let me show you how you should have did it in the beginning. Praise God. Oh, you feel that little electricity that runs through you? That's because that's the 12 and the 12 working together. And they create some kind of a supernatural administration. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
It's not an arbitrary test. When he, 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 he overcomes appetite, he fixes the appetite fall. And so the next one, the next one, he says, cast yourself off this mountain. It's written that he'll give his angels charge over thee. And they'll bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash the foot against a stone. And, and, and Israel tempted God. They tempted God. And the Bible says it was a provocation in the wilderness. And the writer tells us to, not to provoke God as our fathers did in the wilderness and fell. And, 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 and they tempted him at Marah, and they tempted him in fornication. Fiery serpents came among them and, and bit them. Praise God. And Jesus hears this temptation. And he says, I'm not here to prove anything to you. I won't stoop to your distortion of the scripture. But it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. We're not, we're not here to do this. And he overcomes them in that temptation. The third time he overcomes this test, Jesus overcomes the golden calves. <laughs> when, when Satan finally drops all of his games, he, he, reveals his, he reveals his hand. He lays it out on the table. And he says, look, the first two, I was just trying to get you to this spot right here. If you'll just fall down and worship me. If you'll just worship me. That's where he really wants you. That's really where he really wants us. And that's where Israel was when they made those golden calves. And, and Jesus looks back at him and tells him that you will worship only the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. And the second 12 overcomes what the first 12 couldn't do. We stand on that first 12. We are here because of that first 12, but we are complete in the second. And there's a tandem of them working together. Can I take my time and try to bring this subject out to its, to its fullest? Amen. Jesus comes to create a covenant that is an everlasting covenant, a powerful covenant. Uh, so so that's, that's the idea of the 12 and the 12. That's the idea of, of Israel and how how he refers to Jesus as Israel out of Egypt have I called my son and we see glimpses of this we see this 12 and 12 working together first of all we see them in heaven when John looks up and says I saw four and 20 elders and, and, and Paul told the Romans about the, the, the advantage that the Jew has he says unto them were committed the oracles of God and so there, there is an administration of that first 12, a government of 12 that brought us from, from Genesis to Malachi. But when that is over, there's a second 12 that takes over. And it's of the spirit, and it's not of the flesh, and it's not of genetics, but it's, it's a powerful supernatural administration that's going to finish the job. And what the flesh could not do, the spirit will finish by the power of Almighty God. And so this is where we see Joshua enter into the picture. Joshua comes in and they cross the river Jordan. And when they cross the river Jordan, the Bible says that, that, that and I, I mentioned this in Little Rock. I'd like to take a little more time with it tonight. He's, the Bible says that where the priest's feet stood firm, coming through the river Jordan, they said, gather a stone and place it. Now, if you read it very superficially, you'll think they gathered 12 stones and put it in. But if you read it closely, they gathered 24 stones. They put stones inside the river. 12, and they put stones on the bank of the river. Amen. There would be a set of stones that would be visible, and that would be tangible, and that would be immediately accessible. That when generations to come would arise that, that didn't see the manna, and, and didn't see the Red Sea part, and didn't see the Jordan part, they, they would say, what meaneth these stones? And the answer would come back. This is how we came over. I don't ever want to forget how we came over. Amen. And you're going to need them as, as guideposts and as, as ancient landmarks. Put them there, Joshua. And let them be seen. And those 12 tribes were visible and they were on the banks of their life. Each one of them from Reuben on down to Asher 
and, and, and down to Benjamin. They are there as representative and they're physical and they're tangible and they're touchable. I, I see children playing on them uh, in my mind. And, and I, when I look up here and I see these little ones singing and playing and, and they're fidgeting and, and, and they're precious in their childlike worship. They're, they're, they're right here in this sanctuary and they are around principles that are timeless. I see them scampering over those 12 stones, not realizing what they mean and play and hide and seek around those 12 stones. And amen. But one day God's going to show them the fullness of his purpose, that you are part of something so much bigger, something that's going to alter the face of the nations. Put them around those stones. Let them be around those stones. You're absorbing things. You're absorbing principles. You're absorbing concepts. You're the culture of the kingdom is starting to get a hold of you and the things that you grew up with that were common one day are going to blow your mind as to what they meant but there was a second set of 12 you didn't see those yet those were hidden those were underwater they had not been revealed it would require revelation to see those 12 (laughs) but they were there waiting they were there soon to be brought to the forefront it was it was in the water because the spirit is water it's liquid and it's fluid and it's flowing and it's dynamic amen (laughs) i don't think they could have seen us worshiping here in rialto california back there in those days as they celebrated that first 12, I think that's all, that all they thought there was. But little did they know that there would be another group of people that would rise up. And it would be a work of the Spirit. And it would be a washing, moving, flowing, current-based, dynamic, and submerged. They wouldn't know they were there. A subterranean dynamic that would be revealed in time to come. You might not see it yet, but it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And they're going to rise up. And they're going to be strong. And they're going to complete the set. Jesus. And God did reveal them. (laughs) If you read your Bible, Scripture tells us that Joshua began to cross at Gilgal. (laughs) Later on, I read that Elijah crossed at Gilgal. And when he crossed that same Jordan, I think that when he crossed, I think he won't buy stones. There they are. They're really there. And they're not here yet, but they will be. I think that when you take that 12 that you can see and connect them to the 12 that you can't see, I think that fiery chariots start moving. I think that heavenly dynamics start swirling in the atmosphere. I think ancient wheels start turning and heaven's vaults start opening and something powerful happens. Hallelujah. And Elijah was just touching the very base of what was going on. But as he walked by those moss covered, slime covered rocks, he said, there's something in those rocks. There's something in that second 12. I don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be big stuff. Not only did Elijah do it, but on the way back over, Elisha did too. There were men that saw the buried 12. They looked at them. They walked by them. And then Elisha comes back and crosses at the same place that Elijah did. It has to be given from generation to generation. I I wonder if this is why Jesus chose Elias to meet on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Just to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's coming to pass. I don't know what it sounded like on top of that mount. But I just wonder if he said, hey, did you see them rocks? You know what it was now, don't you? See these three guys right here? These guys are the building blocks. (laughs) I'm sorry. I can't let my imagination get ahead of me. I'm not trying to be hyper-spiritual. But I'm just telling you, you're dealing with powerful stuff. 
stuff in the kingdom of God. I believe that when Naaman got down into that Jordan River, I believe there was stuff swirling in that water that had to do with the book of Acts, that had to do with Genesis, that had to do with the judges, that had to do with prophetic implication. There was, there was the power of the 12 and 12. And when he came up seven times, he had the skin of a baby. There was regeneration in those waters. There was new life in those waters. There was, there was, there was degenerative halting power in those waters. It's the 12 and 12. And I believe that this is why John the Baptist, who comes in the spirit of Elias, tells them, generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come, and begins to rebuke them and talk to them. And one of the things he says that always puzzled me was, says, don't think to say to yourself that you're children of Abraham because God is able of these stones. I always thought he was talking about rocks, just... God can miraculously bring something up out of a rock. And I believe that. But I think it's a lot more than that. Because he's in the Jordan as he says it. The context. He's not just anywhere. He's in the Jordan where stones have been placed. God is able of these stones. It wasn't just an arbitrary statement talking about the power of God. It was a prophetic statement. Amen. That God was going to raise up children of Abraham out of the 12 and 12. These buried 12 are going to bring forth kids to Abraham. There's going to be a second 12. And, and they're going to be Irish. And they're going to be Japanese. And they're going to be Mexican. And they're going to be Honduran. And they're going to be Brazilian. And they're going to be German. But God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. God's got a plan that's going to go into Africa. And that's going to go into South America. And that's going to go into, into China. And that's going to move up into and you can't see it yet but your genetics don't impress God your genealogies don't impress God God's got a second 12 and God's able to raise up children and all the while the current of the Jordan moves around the stones It moves around the oneness of God. It moves around Acts 2.38. It moves around buried, submer submerged principles. I hope this isn't too far out there. Because that's not the only place we see it. It is not an accident that Elijah walks up to Mount Carmel. And when he walks up there, he sees 800 false prophets. 400 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the grove. And he sees them and it's one against 800. I'm not afraid to be in the minority. I don't care how many books they've written. I don't care how many people are in their assembly. If you know who the one true living God that answers by fire is, don't you back up because one of you will put a thousand to flight and two of you will put 10,000 to flight. You, you, and you can look at that from a negative doubt perspective you can say well I'm the only one and that's what he said I am left alone and there's none beside me they've killed your prophets they've digged down your altars but we aren't speaking from a position of doubt today we're speaking from a position of faith I'm not talking about I'm the only one I'm talking about God just needed one to get the job done if he needed two he would have sent two but God said all I need to run off 800 false prophets is one guy with my anointing and my power. God's given you more than enough to get the job done. God has given. If you'll just unleash the power that he gave you. If you'll just unleash what you got on Sunday night. On Monday morning. God will change. Come out of your cave. Your cave Elijah. Because. That's another message for another day, but I, it's all built around the 12 and the 12. Because the Bible says that when it became Elijah's turn, that he took 12 stones. Not 13 stones, not 11 stones. He took 12 stones.
And they're not bricks. They're stones. They're not composites. They haven't been assimilated. They haven't taken a little sand and a little gravel and a little this and a little that and and baked in the sun. That's actually what Nimrod did. You build the world by bricks, but God's people are stones. They're not formed and fashioned. They're hewn out of the mountain. They are carved. They are original. He looked at Abraham and Sarah and said, look unto the rock from which you are hewn. I'm trying to tell you, man didn't put it together. God put it together. God, there's a solidity to this doctrine. There's an originality to this doctrine. There's a power, a primal, fundamental power to the doctrine of the apostles. Jesus! He took 12 stones and he rebuilt them. He put them back because they had been built before. And he puts them in the scripture says one for each tribe in Israel tells you that it's right there. This isn't, this isn't Urshan eisegesis. This isn't pie in the sky Holes in my face, J-E-S-U-S theology. <laughs> and, I, and hey, listen, I understand that if you put it under a microscope and if you, if you do, do a, a, a dissertation, a, a doctoral dissertation on it, it might not pass as high academic dynamic. Amen. Because who in the world talks about stones and who, who in the world talks about spiritual wisdom and how in the world can you understand the flowing of the spirit? But yet, but yet the child of 12 years of age confounded them because there's a wisdom that is more profound than any of that stuff. And I'm just telling you, God took 12 stones and he built an altar. And I can't explain it, but I just know he did it. And he said, you want fire to fall? Go get 12 buckets. This is liquid. This, this, this isn't, this isn't, you put your hand in it and you pull it back out and, and, and there's no, there's no effect left in there. I mean, it's water, but there's going to be a supernatural finishing touch and it's going to be 12 buckets. I need 12 buckets of water pour them on the 12 stones pour them on the sacrifice now it's not 10 buckets it's not 14 buckets it's it's 12 buckets it's it's (laughs) it's 12 and 12 and if you take those 12 and you pour them on top of the stone that is already in place. Hey, Talabokushaya. If you do that, then something happens. <laughs> something happens that makes the false prophets run. Something happens that shuts the mouths of the skeptics. Something happens that make den- that shows denomination for the fraud that it is. They can put on a good show, but we know the God that answers by fire. Hallelujah. I, it sounds like Pentecost to me. It sounds like suddenly there came a sound from heaven as 12 apostles connected to what 12 patriarchs did. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there was a God that answered by fire in the book of Acts and there's a God that answers by fire in the book of Kings and it happens when you put them together Praise God. This is built on Reuben. And it's built on Judah. And, 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 and it's built on Simeon. But it also needed Peter. 
and James and John. Hallelujah. And Naphtali and Bartholomew. And you're putting them together. And something up in heaven starts groaning and moving. I'm not even close to being done, folks. Right about now would be a good time to give an altar call, but there's still some stuff I saw when I looked over the edge, and I saw. This is why fog machines can't pull me away from this. This, this is why goatees and, and tight pants can't pull me away from this. I don't care how trendy you think you are. I don't care how cool you think you are. Man, I've got 12 and 12, and I got fire falling. And it, it has nothing to do with the trends and the fads and the fashions. But it's ancient, and it's timeless, and it's supernatural, and it... Ah! Man, it'll make the fire fall in your family. It'll make the fire fall in your school. It'll make the fire fall in Rialto. It'll make you run the aisles. It'll make you talk in tongues. It's just the 12 and 12 coming together. it's going to work but I saw 4 and 20 of them and they're up there and they're in the eternal Can you feel it unlocking? Can you feel the water running down the stones right now? Ah, can you feel it? Can you feel the fire building? Can you feel that? Hey, if you put 12 and 12 together, you'll run Jezebel off. You'll run Ahab off. You'll run the whole passel of false doctrine, false church out of the room. They, they cannot stand before the supernatural administration. This is where the 144,000 come from. Now you can, and, and, and I don't know, I don't know all the answers, folks. There, there may be, there may be a line for Reuben up in heaven. I don't know. Where God took 12,000, he counted them out. 11,998, 11,999, 11, 12,000. Okay, sorry, bub. You missed it. Cut off right there. And then maybe he's counting them out like that with a clicker in his hand. But the exactness of it, and, and, and by the way, these have to all be virgins. They never got married. So, so they're not women, they're men. So it's, it's, it's 12,000 men from each tribe, and that's what John saw in Revelation 7. Maybe that's what it is, but I don't think so. The exactness of it is too perfect. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of hyper-literalism. Where it's going to... And, and people have all kinds of ideas. They're going to be a special group at the end of time. They're going to be a special group. They're, they're, they're going to be all Jewish. It's, it's, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's in there. And, and it may be all of that. But I just can't help but see the 12 and 12. I, 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 there are traits to these 144,000. And they interest me. One of them is that they followed the lamb whithersoever he went. Hallelujah. I think that there were going to be 12 that would follow the lamb wherever he went. 
Hallelujah. One of them laid his head on his breast. Heard the very heartbeat of God. Hallelujah. And they walked with him for three and a half years. Powerful dynamics unleashed there. And they stand upon the shoulders of the 12 patriarchs before them. And they follow the lamb. The Bible says that they are virgins. Now either it's a group of entirely made up of men literally at the end of time. I don't know where the women are. Where's the kids? It's a special group of Jewish men if you take it hyper literally. But I don't think that's what it is. I, 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 think, I think that it's a group of people that would be a remnant of a greater whole. That God's going to call out and he's gonna, it's going to be made up of the 12 and the 12. That's what I believe it is. And, and I also believe that they, they will not have defiled themselves with women. There are defiling women in Revelation. You'll find them in Revelation 17. And the Bible says they polluted the nations and the kings of the earth with the wine of their fornication. It was a harlot and it, she was the mother of harlots. And, and it's a false system that would pollute the world. And all the religious systems of the world that deceive, they're, they're viewed in the feminine. Just like there would be a, a female church, there's a female false church. A false belief system. And it would corrupt men and it would corrupt women. And these are a group of people that says, we are not a part of that. They're not just virgins because they never married. They're virgins because they never defiled themselves with women. There's a reason why we're not Trinitarian. There's a reason why we don't infant baptize. There's a reason why we never sold indulgences. Because we've never defiled ourselves with the women. We've never been a part of denomination. We've never been a part of those that, that, my. I'm not ashamed that I have the oneness of God. I'm not ashamed that I have the name of my husband on my life. And I know his name and his name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. And I haven't defiled myself. I have not. I'm a virgin when it comes to the Trinity. I'm a virgin when it comes to those false doctrines. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. Just like the Bible says. I don't want the easy believism. I don't want the greasy grace. I don't want the name it and claim it. Honey, I got the Holy Ghost. Because I'm part of the... I wasn't baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I was baptized in the name of Jesus because I'm a virgin. (laughs) And this is arbitrary, but this is my weird mind. Can't help it. It just takes off on me. I see where 12 and 12 gets 144. Where's the thousand come from? Why a thousand? I think that when you put them together, something exponential goes. Thousands a big deal in the Bible. And I I didn't know this until I read the writings of a rabbi that talked about thousand. Um, Thousands, the biggest number they had. In their world. You'll never read about a million in the Bible. You'll read about. Thousands and ten thousands. And thousands of thousands. Because thousand was their Google. Thousand meant. A whole lot. And here's a good example of it. God owns the cattle. On a thousand hills. There's more than a thousand hills. In the world. So who owns the cattle on the thousand and first hill? That's the devil's cattle. <laughs> he's, he's raising black Angus. <laughs> no, no. Hyper, hyper literalism will mess you up. Hyper literalism. You'll be waiting on Elijah to show up and Elijah already passed you by because it was John the Baptist. There's a spiritual understanding. And, I, and I'm not trying to be hyper-spiritual. I'm just telling you that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. See, I don't, believe, I don't believe Samson just killed a thousand guys with the jawbone of a donkey. I think he killed an exceeding great army. 
A thousand have I slain. Uh, uh, what was it? 998, 98, 999, a thousand. Okay. All right. I'm thirsty, God. Is that, is that, is that how it was? I think there was an army that rose up that came against him and he slew that army by the help of almighty God. And I think it got to the point where they couldn't count it anymore. It got to the point where they, 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 they lost count of it. So they said he slew a thousand. I'm telling you that 144,000 is God saying it's going to be the two together and it's going to blow your mind. It's going to be so powerful. It's going to be so di- It's, it's 144 Google. It's, 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 there's going to be people getting the Holy Ghost in Rialto and there's going to be people getting the Holy Ghost in South Haven and there's going to be people getting in the Holy Ghost in Sacramento and there's going to be people getting the Holy Ghost in Roatan and there's people going to be getting the Holy Ghost in Africa and Liberia and it's going to be when you put the two together I'm closing. I'm closing. And I, I, I'm just telling you there's things happening right now in the Holy Ghost that are so mind-blowing. <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus got a request one day. He said, I want you to we need you to come. And we need you to come quickly. Because there's a little girl. And she's nigh unto death. She was 12 years old. <laughs> she wasn't 13. And she wasn't 11. She was 12. And Jesus sets out to see the 12 year old girl. And on the way, he meets a woman who comes and tugs at the hem of his garment. And she has an issue of blood for 12 years. You got to see it. You got to see it. Because I, I think that God's ultimate purpose was not just Israel. I think his ultimate purpose was the whole cosmos. I think he, that, that little girl is reminiscent of the girl in the Song of Solomon. Where Israel, the beautiful Israel casts, and she's mature. Israel's a mature woman. And she casts her eyes over and she sees this girl. We have a little sister. She hath no breasts. She's not mature. She, she's not ready yet for betrothal. She's so young. She's not even on the scene yet, but we see her rising. We see her coming into being. And Israel is looking over and seeing the girl. Not here yet, but she will be soon. Is she a wall? Is she a door? And I see Jesus headed towards that little girl. And I see him walking towards all of humanity. And when he got to her, she was dead. She wasn't sick. She didn't have anything left in her. She was dead. This is not just a 12-year-old girl. It's a dead 12-year-old girl. Jesus came to save people who were dead in their trespasses and their sins. He came to save Gentiles and Jews together. He came to put the twelve and the twelve together. Hallelujah. So he goes to try to save those, the whole world in Adam and Eve. He tries to save the whole world in Noah. He tries to save, he's on his way to the girl the whole time. But he detours to the woman. I believe Israel was a detour. I believe that the 12 years was a detour on the way to the final purpose. I think God wants to save everybody. I think he wants to save everybody. Hallelujah. She had an issue of blood. 
I don't know exactly what it was. But in the prophets, the scripture tells us that Israel's righteousness was like filthy rags. That's what it was like. And that filthy rags there for sake of mixed audience, I don't want to get too graphic, but it was, it was menstrual cloth. It was a hemorrhaging, a hemorrhaging. It was, it was, it was a description of uncleanness that the book of Leviticus dealt with intricately. And so here is this woman for 12 years. Here's the 12 and and it's Israel and she is hemorrhaging self-righteousness and she cannot save herself. She doesn't get the whole thing, but she just touches the very hem of his garment and she's made whole. He stops the flow and he delivers her from her dilemma and he is able to save Israel in the flesh. Hallelujah. But he doesn't stop with the 12, but he moves on to the second 12. Hallelujah. Because he's putting them together. Amen. And he's on his way to that little sister. And there she is. And when he walks in there, he walks up to that little body, that dead body. Hallelujah. He puts them all out of the room. And he raises that little girl up from the dead. Hallelujah. Because God's going to save a people. He's going to raise up a people in whom there was no life. She wasn't mature yet. She wasn't on the picture yet. It was the very infancy of what he was doing. It was just the beginning. She's a little sister and she has no breast. She's not even matured into what she's going to be. The day's going to come for the booker when she's going to be worldwide. When she's going to be in the full blossom of her glory. When she's going to be giving birth to babies left and right. It's the church. It's the little sister. And she's powerful. And she's strong. And Jesus was on his way to her the whole time and the stones in the river and the stones in the altar and the 12 and the 12 come together to create something that saves you and it saves me let's stand together let's stand together in the presence of God hallelujah hallelujah Somebody lift your hands right now all over this building. You're standing in the confluence of the two sets of 12. You're standing in a New Testament administration. Hallelujah. And we're dumping the water on top of the stones. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming into dead people and he's raising them up. He's coming into dead people and he's raising them up by the power. You who were dead and trespasses and sins have been quickened together in Christ Jesus. And so John saw a city, a new Jerusalem, and it had 12 gates. And it had 12 stones in the foundation and Jesus is the chief cornerstone and it's 12 and it's 12 and we're going to live there and we're going to rejoice with him and John said I saw it I saw it coming together and it's beautiful hallelujah I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. People assume that Israel takes priority of place, but I believe that the Israel of God takes the priority of place. It's all God's people. Amen. Physical and spiritual. I think it's a powerful administration of the two coming together. And and I think that we came in. It's significant that the patriarchs are the gates, but the apostles are the foundation. We're built on that. The whole thing was built on the revelation of what God was going to do at the very end. He called the end from the beginning. He knew what he was doing from the foundation of the world. And he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the apostles are in the foundation. And the patriarchs are how you got in. I want somebody somebody to step down here. I want somebody to come and start to rebuild the altars in your life. And start to pour some water over those stones. That's what you do when you worship. 
I want somebody to part the waters and I want you to see those 12 stones. I want you to see the hidden and I want you to look up and see the manifest. What meaneth these stones? What meaneth these stones? The power that will pull you out of your drug addiction is the power that fell on Mount Carmel. The power that will pull you out of your family's dysfunction is the power that raised that little girl up off that deathbed. Oh! I'm talking about the mystery of the twelves today. I'm trying to tell somebody why it is like it is. I want somebody, I want you to break the bread. And I want you to take home 12 baskets full. I want you to take home 12 baskets full. You got to have 12 baskets to put this thing in. Oh, somebody can exalt him today. Right where you are, somebody lift up your voice. Somebody help me praise him. Come on, Elijah. Build the altar in your